All right. Ready? Yes. Okay. Put it into words for me, Mel. What Whoops. does uh, yeah right? Oops. <laughs> what does sixty years in the entertainment business feel like to you? It feels like about six years. It really does. Uh, I've been performing for so long that uh, to think back in terms of literally decades of performing uh, is it's almost impossible for me to do. It's tough. I mean, I'm sixty-five today. Today is September thirteenth when we're doing this. Right. And. I must say, I look in the mirror and I say, this is ridiculous. I mean, I don't feel 65. I don't think I look 65, although maybe I do. But um, it's just a number as far as I'm concerned. That number plus the number of years I've been in the business, which is really, it's really my 61st year in show business because I broke in as a baby performer at the age of four, <laughs> 1929, with the old uh, Coon Sanders Orchestra at the Black Hawk Restaurant in Chicago. So it really is my... I'm in my 61st year in the business. Now push your memory back, and I'm sure you can. Tell us about your first job that you really remember. I remember that job. I remember it for a lot of reasons. I went in and sang, because I used to listen to the radio all the time, and heard this orchestra, Coon Sanders, Carlton Coon, Joe Sanders. And uh, I went into the Black Hawk with my parents one night, and I started singing at the table to make a long story painless. Uh, the, the band leader came over and said, what's this kid, this little, what is he, a dwarf? He says, no, he's our son, right. and he knows all of your tunes. They got me up on the stage, and I sang, You're Driving Me Crazy, and I became a Monday night feature there. And I remember it distinctly, and particularly that first night, because Carlton Kuhn, who was the drummer, after I sang, he was, you know, surprised and I guess delighted and he picked me up and he put me on his knee as he played the bass drum as he played the dance set right. and I, f I remember that vividly don't ask me what I had for breakfast this morning I can't tell you <laughs> but, <laughs> but I do remember that very vividly and uh, I remember all the early times in vaudeville in Chicago which is my hometown uh, I played virtually every theater in Chicago, mainly the outlying theaters, not the, the biggies downtown, mm -hmm. as part of a kid vaudeville unit. And I, I really distinctly remember those times. Were they, were they very happy times, you remember? Oh, enormously. I mean, ever since I can remember, I, I, I love music and I'd always wanted to be in show business. And getting into it at that early an age, I think, was very valuable for me because it does give you, I think, a sense of perspective. I know a lot of people in the business, and I, I say this with great sadness, who are tragic because they got in the business, let's say, in their college years or maybe mm -hmm. late high school years, got a hit record, and then all of a sudden, the balloon burst. Mm -hmm. And all this instant fame and popularity and notoriety, if you will, suddenly just kind of went down the drain. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very hard on a lot of people that I've known. Mm. Let's call what they, what do they call it? Flash in the pan or something like that? Well, I think that's kind of a cruel <laughs> way to put it. Right but I mean, I, I think what it is is an instant career followed by, sadly, mm. a, a public, particularly in pop music, uh, that says, okay, well, you know, that was great and we loved it and it was a great hit record. Now let's move forward. Mm -hmm. The public is, I've been very lucky, the public is, uh, can be rather fickle. And I've been one of those people that gets on his knees every night and faces the force, good God, right, Mecca, right. whatever, and thanks God and, and all the other forces that, uh, that I've been lucky enough to survive. And as one critic put it in, in Washington, a guy named John Seagraves, when I said I've survived, he said, no, you've prevailed. And that knocked me out. I mean, I thought that was one of the nicest things anybody ever said to me. Yeah, well, it's true. It certainly is true. And you're talking about a business that can eat you alive. I mean, yeah. uh, Think of it, if you put your finger on one reason uh, relating to this, how you've lasted in your uh, longevity in this business, to what do you attribute to it, if you could think of one thing? I think mainly it's because I never relied, as almost all of my peers did, on hit records. I never relied on that. I always relied on a good in-person performance where people, I used to call the people who came to see me again and again, I used to say I had a high rate of recidivism <laughs> on the part of my my audiences, because they did come back again and again, sure. and they and I, and still do, mm -hmm. and they know that when I do come back in, that they're not going to look at each other and say, "Well, th that's the same show you did last year or last month." Or I always, const I'm constant in changing my repertoire, my act. 
uh, even some of the silly dialogue that I do. Mm -hmm. Just to keep it fresh and to have people say, well, we liked him last time, but he's got some new things cooked up for us this time. And I, I usually do. I always do, as a matter of fact. Well, that's, that's very important. I mean, because you I do hear so. that when you see a performer. Oh, I saw that already. I saw this on HBO. I saw yeah. this already, right? Exactly. You hear exactly. it. Exactly. Uh, early on, say when you were in your teens or 20s, did you ever in your mind imagine that you would be here today as popular as you are and as slim as you are? No. And by the way, this is not me. This is a jacket. This is a jacket that the Night Court people gave me. Turn around and show the back yeah. there for a second. For show you the logo on the back. Okay? Yeah. And uh, they gave me this jacket, but it, as you can see, when yes. they gave me this jacket, right. sadly, yes. I filled the jacket. Now look at it. See? <laughs> look that's at right. this. That's right. It's incredible. You know, it's, it's amazing. So I don't want you to think that's me. This yes, it, is me. Down. That's right. And he's yeah. sitting down too, which is also deceiving because yeah. when you stand up, it's Flat, flat, like a washboard mill. Absolutely. <laughs> and I'm going to stay that way, too, believe me. So you really didn't, you had no idea that it was going to be this part. Well, let me put it this way. One would assume that if you have a career, that there's a peak time for it, okay? And that peak time usually is in your youth or later youth. But when I look you in the eye and tell you that 1989 was the biggest year I have ever had in my entire career, and 1990 is going to top it, mm. absolutely top it. it. It's a source of delight, of course, but it's also a, a source of amazement to me. Now, when you no, say I'm, let me answer your question. You're right. I never would dream in those days that my career would have escalated to the point where the best days of it, from a standpoint of, of uh, good things happening, career moves happening, you know, good money and everything, mm -hmm would be happening now. Mm. I would have thought it would have been on the decline and I'd be very happy to get whatever jobs I could, you know. And as it is, uh, it's the busiest time of my life. Yeah. It's just, it's amazing. Yeah, really, go figure, right? Well, you, you, you can still pack them in. You still, people appreciate you. They like to hear, you know, like to hear, they like to see you. You, you still have, I mean, I know you didn't, weren't happy years ago with the Velvet Fog, but I mean, people come to see the legend. Well, a legend in my own lunchtime. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a legend in my own mind. Right. No, well, no, actually, the truth is that uh, the people who did grow up with me and with right. whom I grew up, uh, I used to be rather churlish about the Velvet Fog thing. And right. I used to say, hey, don't, don't call me that. I hate that. But I've grown very mellow about it because an awful lot of people looked upon that with a lot of affection. Right. And I think it's, it's, it's incorrect and not proper for me to be putting that down. And I've, people come up to me now in airports and right. in, in concert venues in which I appear and say, hey, you know, when we were growing up and we're going to you know, high school and you were the velvet fog, right. and I say, yeah, 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 <laughs> interesting days. You know, <laughs> right. I just leave it alone. Right. Uh, speaking of the voice, uh, over 60 years, what has been your method of operation to, to keep it there, to keep it strong over the years? Well, how do you? It's really the simplest formula imaginable. Number one, I have never smoked anything of any kind, ever once in my life. I am violently anti-cigarette. I am violently anti-drugs right. of all kinds. Okay, right. So that's been one thing, I think, in my favor from a standpoint of health right. and my throat. Right. Uh, I don't drink hard liquor. Uh, very rarely I might have a, a good glass of wine with dinner, right. which I do like. But again, that's maybe once or twice a month, if that. So that's number two. Number three, the greatest panacea, at least in my opinion, is sleep. And when I have to work and I know I have to sing, I realize that there's a rejuvenating process that has to go on. You've really got to rejuvenate your throat on a, on a nightly basis. So I try to manage without pills to get anywhere from seven to eight hours sleep. I can operate on six. That's okay. Six? It's yeah. okay. Uh -huh. mm, it's margin. Yeah. Seven is quite good. Eight. Boy, that's when I realize as I get to the end of a, an hour or an hour and ten minute performance, right. when normally your throat you're saying, oh, <clears throat> God, well, excuse me, folks. But if you get eight hours sleep, if, at least if I do, then I can tell you right now that I can, I can sing all night. So that basically explains why you came to the door today when you're a nightcap. Right. Uh, that's right. I just want to make sure. Okay. Right. My, my <laughs> Rip Van Winkle nightcap. Right. <laughs> now, another aspect of your life, I mean, you do so many things. I mean, you really are, what do they call it, not even a renaissance, so multifaceted. And one of the hats you wear is author. And mm -hmm. I know you just completed a book on um, Buddy Rich, I guess it was, it's right. called Traps. It's 
called Traps the Drum Wonder. The Drum Wonder. Which was Buddy's name in vaudeville when he was a child star. Not just a child star, but at the age of three, he was the highest paid child star in the world. Mm. Only supplanted a little bit later by Jackie Coogan when he came out with Chaplin and mm -hmm. The Kid, you right. know. But prior to that, Buddy Rich was the highest paid child star. He was known as Traps, of course, Traps being a, a kind of a slang expression for a drummer, Drums. all the trappings of right. the drummer. Traps the drum wonder. And even at that age, he was an absolute wonder. He was extraordinary. Now you've worked on this for how many years? Actually, Buddy and I started working on this book together in 1975. And we would go out to Central Park and talk about it and mm -hmm. tape it. I've got a lot of tape of him talking. Mm -hmm. And then I laid it aside to do my own autobiography because I was requested to do it by my publisher. And then by the time I started writing the Buddy Rich biography again, mm -hmm. he was terminally ill. Right. And the day before he passed away, I spent three and a half hours with him and said, I'll see you tomorrow, champ. And I was on the way to the house where he was staying when my daughter Daisy called me in my car and said, Dad, pull the car over. I've got something to tell you. And she told me that Buddy had died. Uh, I made him an absolute moral promise that I would finish the book and that we'd get the book published. And I can't begin to tell you how thrilled I am that the publisher is Oxford University Press because they're one of the most prestigious mm -hmm. publishers, I think, in the world today. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm floating on air about it. I'm really excited <laughs> about it. Things are going so well. I mean, really, it's, it's so exciting. It's absolutely true. You're, when things go this well, I, I must tell you that, you know, you're, you just, you say, good God, please, please God, don't let the bubble burst. I was going to say, Mel, when you walk across the street, look both ways. Oh, I do. <laughs> okay, Believe please be careful. Oh, my head's on a swivel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, speaking of the man, what were some of the components which made Buddy Rich so great? Well, he was not unlike somebody else that I wrote a book about. I wrote a book about my experiences writing the old Judy Garland television show mm -hmm. in 1963. And it's not a full-blown biography of Judy. It's right. just about that year and seven or year and eight months right. that I wrote the musical material on the Judy Garland show. And when the book came out, a lot of people said, why did you write this book about Judy Garland? I said, well, because to be completely frank, she was loving and witty and warm and blindingly talented and bitchy <laughs> and unprofessional right. and difficult. And those to me are sometimes the components that make up a genius performer. Mm -hmm. In other words, the, the last few little uh, uh, descriptions that I gave of Judy are not put downs. They are part of why she's interesting. I love Pat Boone. He's one, of, he's one of the loveliest guys in the world, but I don't know if I could ever write a book about Pat because he's just such a marvelous, quiet, right. nice man. Judy was extremely controversial, and so was Buddy Rich. Buddy was very much like Judy in that he was a genius performer, a child star, mm -hmm. very, very witty, one of, the, one of the sharpest and quickest wits I've ever run into in my life a great dresser. He was always very natty. He, as a matter of fact, he was a trendsetter at times with his, the way he dressed. He was also a very difficult man, sometimes abusive and abrasive. And again, there they are. There are those qualities that make up somebody interesting about whom to write. And that's why I wrote that book. Well, I mean, talk about when you wrote uh, Stone All Velvet about yourself, uh what are some of those qualities that we don't see, the abrasive qualities? Where's, yes, the, where's the mean yes. guy? I see a nice guy here. No, no, no. I want to be completely honest about myself. And I think that if you read It Wasn't All Velvet, you know that I, uh, I'm trying to remember who told me this. Some, somebody in the industry said, uh, I'll tell you who it was, and I'm not dropping names. Right. We live on the same street, and we become friends, Charlton Heston. Right. Uh, he wrote me a beautiful letter about my book, and he said, uh, you weren't easy on yourself. That's what I liked about this. You weren't, it wasn't gilding your own lily and then taking it out on other people. Uh, when, when I felt that I deserved to be thought of well, I wrote about myself that way. When I, I felt that I had made some terrible boo-boos and faux pas and that I had been wrong about things, I wrote about that too. Because I have my own mm, storehouse, and it's not a big one, right. but there is a storehouse in every performer of some temperament. 
My temperament is very much like Jerry Lewis's, a man I, I love. I worship him as a friend and right. as a performer. And I worship his ideology. And what he says is, if I'm prepared to give 115% of myself, you all better do the same. Right. I will not stand for incompetence. And the only time I really get uptight, and the only time I ever show any, I don't think I'm ever abrasive, but the only time I really ever get my back up right. is when somebody is capable of doing the job and doesn't do it. They lapse into a kind of, oh, this is good enough. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it be a lead trumpet player in a band w with whom I'm working, uh, with which I'm working, I should right. say. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, anybody in the business. An interviewer? No, no. <laughs> Mostly, the only time I really get disturbed with interviewers is when they don't do their homework. Right. And right. when an interviewer sits down and says, well, Mel, tell me about yourself. Where did you start? Right. I go, oh, yeah, no, didn't, good didn't Lord. Didn't read no. the bio. <laughs> right. you know, yeah, read the bio. Yeah, really. Let's go back to Buddy for a second. Okay. Okay, are we all set? Yeah. Okay. Um, where was I? Okay. <laughs> Larry, Buddy, all right. What is the fondest memory that you have, and this might be tough, it might be too personal, but of your relationship, you know, your personal relationship with this man? See, that's really interesting. He pulled a lot of pranks on me. He did a very funny prank, which I, by the way, uh, delineate very strongly in the book. Uh, I was playing the Maisonette Room of the St. Regis Hotel in 1974, and he had a little club called Buddy's Place. Mm -hmm. Uh, on 2nd Avenue and 65th, I think, or 64th, yeah. upstairs. And he, was, he had a little sextet in there, and I called one night on a Saturday night and said, I'd like to come over and hear you for the late show. He said, great. Well, you know, he talked very gruffly. He says, hey, I'll set it up for you, man. Just come yeah. on over and sit in and, and see what you think of it. So I went over, and the place was jammed, and he had a very nice seat up in front for me, and I sat and watched the set, which was, you know, Spectacular. Right. And at the end of the set, he came out from behind the drums and he, you know, he had a towel around him and he was doing his number. And finally, he said, Ladies and gentlemen, we have somebody with us tonight who's a great friend and, you know, one of America's great singers. And he went through this whole routine, you know. And he finally said, I'm really happy to welcome, and I know you'll be happy to see him too, Mr. Mel Torme. And I stood up and not one single person applauded. <laughs> Dead <laughs> silence. And if you've never seen anybody stand up and go, <laughs> oh, wait a minute. he had set it up, obviously. Of course, you know. yeah. And I, see, I thought that was one of the funniest, and I, nobody laughed harder than I did, you know. Uh, that was the enduring side of Buddy. He had a funny, quirky, wonderful mind. We played a lot of dates together that I enjoyed. We played Carnegie Hall together, uh, the Hollywood Bowl together. Mm. Um, and we played some dates on the road, some concert dates, in which we were able, during which we were able to sit down and really kind of have some very serious talks about a lot of things. And that's mainly when I saw a side of him that a lot of people didn't see. And that was a very sentimental, very sensitive side to Buddy Rich. Hmm. I mean, that was the alter ego side of Buddy, you know. Now you are, in this particular engagement, actually playing a set of, on a set of his drums? Yes, I'm playing the last set of drums that Buddy used before he found an antique set, an old set, of Slingerland drums. So we've both been endorsing Slingerland drums since the year one. Right. And uh, this was his very last workable set prior to, and of course it's owned by Kathy, his daughter, who mm -hmm. incidentally sings with me every night. She comes up and sings a tune every night with the band. Uh, so yes, um, they're legitimately Buddy Rich's drums with his logo. Now, I heard this on the radio the other day in the car, and just for the TV audience, uh, what was Buddy Rich's credo? Remember you were saying, remember what you said? Oh, well, he had a lot of credos. I mean, one of them was next, he used to say next all the time, straight ahead. He used to say straight ahead all the time. And that was the way he lived. I mean, he was a very straight arrow kind of guy. Uh, he was totally devoted to jazz and hated sham, hated uh, anyone who wasn't at least attempting to be original mm -hmm. and unique. And anybody who was a copycat musician, uh, he really had very little use for it uh, because he himself was an original. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever played drums like that. I told him about the book, I said, now do you want this to be a puff piece about you? And he said, nope, write it warts and all, just be sure it's accurate. That's what he was concerned about. I heard from both Marie, his 
widow, mm -hmm. and from Kathy today, who've just read the book. They finished it today. They're absolutely washed in the book. They just absolutely love mm. the book. Thank God, because that's one thing that concerned me. I mean, I want, I want the family to feel that I've done him justice. Right. Yeah. Now, th this is tough. Who are the buddy riches of today? Are there any? There's one, my drummer, Donny Osborne, is literally the only guy that plays so much like Buddy that on opening night with the Buddy Rich Band at Michael's Pub, uh, Marie Rich walked up to me and said, my God, Donny is the only drummer I have ever heard with this band. Sounds like Buddy with the band. Mm. It's amazing. Mm. Donny was Buddy's protege, Don Osborne, and, uh, and designated as so by Buddy. So uh, he's exactly the right drummer to be playing drums with the band. I just play one number with the band, right. you know, just for fun. Right. Um, all right. Wrapping up here, when people mention the name Mel Torme, what do you want them to be talking about? Gee, that's kind of a hard one. Well, I would, I'd like to think that they, that they would... Uh, evaluate me in their minds as somebody who has tried to stick to his guns musically, uh, who represents a certain kind of music and a certain, if you will, taste in music, whatever that is, because it's all subjective. Music is totally subjective. If a kid comes along on the street and says, well, my parents like you, but I like Motley Crue, if that's what he hears and that's what he thinks is good music, who am I or anybody else to say, are you kidding? I mean, if that's what he feels is good music, then that's good music to him. So it is subjective, it really is. I would just like him to think well of me from a standpoint of being a quality performer, quality singer, arranger, hopefully even as an author. Well, I mean, uh, I think all those uh, adjectives and uh, attributes are worn very well by I you. I hope so, thank you. Uh, we look forward to a big success here in New York with another engagement every yeah. year. And the yeah. book, when it comes to what, about a year? About a year. About a year from now. Yeah. And stay thin. You are going to stay thin. Should I pull it down? Should I make it safe? Very good. You nice time. Always a pleasure. Thank, Thank you very you. Thank much. You, I appreciate it. Pleasure. Okay.